Very good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome you to the symposium, the fifth symposium of the annual academic sessions of the 30th anniversary celebrations of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Karenia. I'm Dr. Sujivani Kruklasuria from the Department of Pharmacology. I'm a rheumatologist, and uh, I uh, this session is dedicated to metabolic disease and improving bone health to minimize fracture risk. We have three eminent speakers lined up for you. Uh, they are Professor Sarat Lekhambasam, uh, Dr. Shoshana Stasel mazer and Dr. Dulani Kottachi. So as we know, osteoporosis is the commonest metabolic bone disease, it affecting more than 200 million people worldwide. People over the age of 50, females have a one in, one in three females and one in five males have a risk of fragility fractures. So that shows the, how big the problem is and how we may not exactly uh, addressing the issues. So uh, moving on uh, to the first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Sarat Lekambasam. He is the Chair Professor, Department of Medicine, University, uh, University of uh, Gaul, Sri Lanka, and the former Dean at the University of Rahuna. He is a pioneer in the field of osteoporosis in Sri Lanka. He was the past President of the Ceylon College of Physicians in 2012 and Osteoporosis Sri Lanka from 2010 to 2012. He established the first DXA machine in Sri Lanka in 1998. He has over 200 publications in peer-reviewed journals with 1,180 citations, he and he has authored many chapters in books. He has received many national and international awards. He has contributed to eight orations and keynote speeches. He has supervised over 12 PhD students. In summary, he is the be all of osteoporosis in Sri Lanka. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson, for those uh, wonderful words. And uh, my task for the next 24, 25 minutes or so is to tell you about the um, intervention thresholds based on uh, practice outcome. The main objective of in the osteoporosis treatment is to find out who should receive treatment and who should not receive treatment. And as you, as the chairperson will rightly said, osteoporosis is quite prevalent in the community. And one other problem which is quite prevalent in the community is that the, the most of the patients who are treated with the pharmacologic agents actually do not deserve treatment and they're quite unnecessarily treated. And also the people who really need treatment are not treated. So that's another problem we have. So there's a huge care gap when you come to osteoporosis treatment. Now, what is FRAX? I'll give you a very brief introduction to FRAX. Now, in, yeah. in 1994, the WHO study group developed what is called the BMD-based diagnostic classification. Now, Professor Kenison's group in 1994 developed this classification in order to uh, provide a uniform platform for the clinicians as well as researchers to diagnose osteoporosis. Now, before 1994, we were working on osteoporosis, but then we did not have actually a diagnostic classification fallback. As most of you all know, osteoporosis is defined based on the T-score of the of BMD data. And when it is less than minus 2.5, you call somebody osteoporosis. And if the bone mineral density is minus one or greater, then you have normal bone mineral density. And in between, we have what is called the quite undefined group, what is called people with osteopenia. Although in 1994, WHO introduced this uh, diagnostic classification to provide the uniform platform, the clinicians very quickly extrapolated this information, this diagnostic categorization to make therapeutic decisions. So their understanding was that the patient with osteoporosis would fracture and the patient with, with normal bone mineral would not fracture. 
and the, of course they had no idea about what will happen to the patient with osteopenia. So they thought that there's a fracture occurrence as per a hierarchical kind of arrangement and based on this uh, diagnostic category, which is of course a misunderstanding. And also one of the great limitations that we had with this classification was that actually on T, based on the T-scores, we can give only what is called the relative risk and the interpretation of relative risk without absolute risk also is a bit of a problem. And also this approach completely disregarded other clinical risk factors relevant for a fracture. The major insult for this kind of, so there are quite uncertainties when we are when we dealing with patients. Based on this kind of understanding, you can find that patient number one, who is a 65 woman with a backache and a spine T score minus 2.7 for osteoporosis and like to receive treatment. But if you look at the patient number two and three, a 65 woman with the Parkinson's disease, recurrent falls, but the T score in the range of osteopenia. Or if you think of, of a woman of 68 years with giant cell arthritis on practice on 40 milligram in osteopenia, very unlikely to receive treatment. But you know that patient number two and three are likely to get fracture more than patient number one. So the major challenge for this kind of understanding came from this epidemiological data in 2004. And you can see that bone mineral density scores actually deteriorate in this way. And as well as the fracture risk, the red columns indicated the risk of fracture. There's a relative risk of fracture, how it increases with the T-score as T-score deteriorates. But then the epidemiological data shows us the most of the fractures occur in what is called the patient with osteopenia. And they were, they were large in numbers. And then most of the fractures are confined to them. True that a patient with a normal bone mineral density also have fractures that we can understand because a patient with a normal blood pressure can develop a stroke or a patient with a normal cholesterol can develop a myocardial infarction in the same way. And true that patient with osteoporosis is also fractured but they were less in number. So in 2004, the WHO again was asked to look at this in detail. And then what they did was actually they trying to understand this, they found that there's a huge geographical variation of the fracture occurrence. And also they find that the fracture occurrence, that there's a gender variation of fracture occurrence. And also there are other factors like a family history, group corticoids, the prior fracture. And then you can see that when you add clinical risk factor into that, you know, I mean, the, the, the probability of fracture increased. So they understood for the first time that the apart from the bone mineral density, there are the determinants of fractures, like right? these, these are the other clinical variables. So based on that, they did algorithm. And this algorithm, let's say, if you answer, uh, answer a couple of questions, like whether you have a rheumatoid arthritis, you are in blue corticoids, I got a prior fracture. And then the way you answer this, and then would determine your probability of getting fracture. So this is the algorithm that WHO used in order to develop what we call the FRAX model. The FRAX model was introduced for the main for the, in the USA as well as the European countries and Australia to begin with. But in 2012, the Sri Lanka joined the FRAX model and we developed our Sri Lankan FRAX model. Now, FRAX is country and gender specific and it takes age BMI as continuous numerical variables in the model and consider past history of fracture, the parental history of fracture, use of blue corticoids, habits like smoking and alcohol, rheumatoid arthritis, the secondary causes of osteoporosis and they take them in a dichotomous manner, like yes or no, and what's one of the major allegations for the price action. And it will work wonderfully with or without one minute density. And our, our work, our published work, indicated that in Sri Lankan model, even without BMD, generate almost the same, same outcome. And it, it gives what is called the probability of getting a hip fracture or major osteoporotic fracture within the next 10 years. And it's a major osteoporotic fracture that includes hip, clinical spine, wrist, and humerus fracture. Now, instead of relative risk, this time we get what is called absolute risk like in 20%, 30% as a percentage, that is your risk of getting a fracture within the next 10 years. Now, the FRAX and the intervention thresholds should go together, complementary each other, like a Miriam Lamb. The file FRAX assesses the absolute fracture risk for the next 10 years, the intervention threshold will determine 
who require and who does not require interventions. Again, as soon as intervention thresholds were introduced, there was a misconception among clinicians. The misconception was that the intervention equals a specific treatment, which is not so. So intervention thresholds identify those who need specific treatment for further evaluation. Now, for example, the National Osteoporosis Guidelines Group in the UK has a category and where between certain intervention thresholds, people we need a further assessment, not, a, not, not treatment. Now, USA Prevention Service Task Force also has same same kind of recommendation. So they recommend bone mineral density for all women above 65 years. And also that without bone mineral density, if a person younger than 65 years has got a major osteoporotic fracture, probability more than 9%, and that patient also requires BMD assessment. So here, a clear example where the fracture probability intervention threshold is used to determine who should get a bone mineral density treatment. Now, this is a clear example where intervention threshold would define who needs treatment, who, who does not need treatment. Whereas this is the another example where the people in the red zone would require treatment, people in the green zone would not require treatment, but in the people in, in, in the middle would require bone mineral density assessment in order to fine tune their fracture, the probability. Now, fractures available in 65 countries, and I'm not going to go into the details, and quite a lot of countries in the Asian region. But then, uh, notable exceptions are in the Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh, and uh, where you get a, a sizable proportion of the Asian population. So you can say a sizable proportion of the Asian population still do not have their own fax model. Now, frax based intervention thresholds, the survey done by the National Osteoporosis Guidelines Group in the UK and the International Osteoporosis Foundation, uh, so it was in, sorry, International Osteoporosis Foundation in 2016, and the publication said that there are 120 guidelines for academic papers incorporating frax as a screening tool to identify high risk patients. But then, uh, 38 of those guidelines did not give a clear indication about the intervention thresholds. So they just left it alone, open, and did not give a listing. So this is actually I highlighted in one of the publication. And uh, although many Asian countries have developed their own tax models to country needs, only very few countries have developed their own intervention thresholds. And actually they are in the process of developing. Now when you look at the types of intervention thresholds, there are several. Now, for example, you get what is called fixed inter intervention threshold. That's a single cutoff value to market those who need intervention. Now, there's one called age-dependent intervention threshold. It's a series of values based on the patient's age. The hybrid intervention thresholds are available in two countries, including Sri Lanka. It's a combination of fixed for younger age group and age-dependent for older adults. I'll, I'll talk about that later on. The two-tier intervention thresholds are introduced by it. By us in uh, at the last year is a combination of two sets of fixed intervention thresholds for two age groups. They were we thought they were required because there were obvious problems in the first two methods. Now this is a, a example of what is called fixed intervention threshold. This is just one value and it completely regardless of the age. It doesn't change the age. But if you look at the age-dependent intervention threshold, that varies with age. So somebody, let's say, uh, having a 10% fracture probability, whether the patient receive treatment or not, will depend on the patient's age. The hybrid intervention thresholds, I can see, is a combination of fixed intervention threshold for younger people, younger than 70 years in this case, and then age-dependent intervention threshold for people who are 70 and above. Now, how do you develop intervention thresholds? There's no uniform method. The age-dependent intervention thresholds you develop on a principle is on a rational way. Let's say if a woman with a fragile fracture is eligible for treatment, as spelled out in most of the intervention guidelines, let's say a same age woman who has same fracture probability, but not had a fracture yet, based on clinical risk factors. The fact that the patient has got rheumatoid arthritis on corticosteroids and parental fracture, based on those that, those information, 
if the patient fracture probability is equal to the fracture probability of the of a woman who altogether fracture probability, then that second patient also need treatment. So based on that, many countries like the UK, Sri Lanka, and subsequent India, Singapore, and Philippines, and there you have the, what is called age dependent intervention thresholds based on that, that rationale. The fixed intervention thresholds are developed by many methods. Just one here, economic evaluation, for example, US and Taiwan, and they develop what's called economic model, and then develop the fixed intervention thresholds. And also age dependent intervention thresholds can be fine tuned, you can tweak it and fine tune. We get a best point which is which gives a high sensitivity and specificity. And this is a method adopted by Sri Lanka, Singapore, and Philippine both month, month ago. And we call the Philippine intervention thresholds as well on this principle. But Australia and Japan use another method that is the they pick a point that demands a correct proportion of women in the population with a high fracture risk. So by sort of tight trading that point up and down, and then we come to a point which demarcate that proportion of women. Now, what is the best method? There's no best method. It should be decided locally by individual countries to suit the economy and capacity, healthcare capacity, screening facilities, reimbursement and all. And then that should be decided by locally by the particular country. Now, since there's a different type, different methods of deriving intervention thresholds, even you take, let's say, fixed intervention thresholds, there's a huge variation in, in Asian countries. For example, in China as long as 4% and Philippines almost like 4%. And then it runs to near 15% in Taiwan and Japan. You see, there's a wide variation of this, the major osteoporotic fracture probability of fixed intervention threshold. I would say a few words about the National Osteoporosis Guidelines Intervention Threshold, which is thoroughly misused and misunderstood. This was developed in 2009 on economic principles, so it's quite old actually. The, at that time, the Alentronite was the main treatment, and since then, there are so many other treatments that have come up in the osteoporosis as a stable treatment. And this clearly, this publication said this is valid only for the USA. And the USA has a very rigid policy of screening. And then, uh, let's say a 55-year-old woman with a backache would not qualify, like in our country, would not qualify for DEXA scan. Now, the NOF recommends interventions for those with the bone mineral density in the osteoporosis range. And for the osteopenic, then the major osteoporotic fracture probability should, should go more than 20% or the fracture probability more goes more than 3%. This point for the USA, we are, let's say, a 65, let's say, for you to get a DEXA scan, um, uh, 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 Female has to be more than 65 years, or if it is younger than 65 years, need to addition risk factor, which is, of course, not in operation in Sri Lanka. And just backache somebody with a backache for, let's say, for 20 years, get a DEXA scan and receive treatment. And these guidelines, the National Osteoporosis guidelines, have been blindly copied by many other countries. Now, Asian countries, actually, let's say Singapore and Philippines, were using enough guidelines until recently and then the Singapore we recently developed a cutoff value for Singapore and now Philippines about a month ago uh, got the intervention threshold so they are trying to uh, go uh, move away from the enough uh, intervention thresholds to more rational approach in Sri Lanka the intervention thresholds were developed first time in 19 2019 and at that time we thought major osteoporotic probability of 11% and the fracture probability of 3% was so the best cutoff. But then with the improved, uh, more, more, more robust uh, calculation method and with a large, a larger database, and we thought that the 9% major osteoporotic fracture probability and 3% hip fracture probability would be a most suitable intervention threshold we revised. Not many countries have revised their intervention threshold. I think Australia has done it, but most of the countries have not revised their intervention threshold. Now, what are the merits and demerits of the age-dependent age intervention thresholds? It is um, based on the concept that fracture probability varies with age that I already said, but only thing that the set of the series of values will be difficult for a clinician to remember unless you provide that in a, let's say, a desktop, uh, let's say something to be kept on the desktop or some kind of, you know, printout is difficult to remember. Now, this is one of the major problem is that over treatment of young people. 
If I give an example, a 50-year-old woman with a BMI 25, just because patient has got a parental history of fracture with a normal bone mineral density and would get a fracture probability of 2.6, which is, of course, equal to the treatment uh, intervention threshold. So, a woman with a just one clinical risk factor with normal bone mineral density would qualify for treatment here. But again, if you take 70 year old woman, BMI 25, with a parental history of fracture and osteoporosis, osteopenia, and then that person would have only 13% fracture probability, which will fall short, fall short of 15%, which is required for treatment. So if you look at the second person, 70 year old woman, and then think probably that patient would require treatment, but then she would not qualify. So this is one of the major problems we had with the age dependent intervention thresholds. Then fixed intervention thresholds is easy to remember, but then it again leads to the under treatment of young because you take uh, just one point under treatment of young people and over treatment of older people. So there's a problem with that. So hybrid intervention thresholds came to correct some of these deficiencies, and there are age dependent intervention thresholds are given for those over 60 70 years and the fix for those younger. So this trying to avoid overtreatment of young people, which people think is one of the major problems. Because when you treat young people, let's say you start somebody on treatment at the age of 55 years, just because person happened to have a minus 2.5 at his score. And with, a, with let's say, bisphosphonate, you can go up to about, let's say, five years, so maybe seven years, and the patient is only 62 years, and then you have to intro treatment. And then this is the right time for the patient to get a fracture because now this time patient will be without harmful treatment and certain patient is like to get a fracture. So this is one of the this what is the hybrid intervention threshold trying to actually uh, correct. Now what about intervention thresholds for men? As Chairperson quite rightly said, the men are also can get osteoporotic fracture, not when they can they are, they are sitting, they can they can they are sitting pretty. And then uh, there's a lot of 20 percent of chance for them to get a fracture during their lifetime. Now, intervention thresholds in the men has not been very widely spoken about. In, in actually, osteoporosis in men is one of the one of the major area that has been sort of you know left out, and then people have not discussed very much. And uh, there's a, a meeting, a year of meeting coming up, bit of advertising, a year of meeting coming up in December first, and then. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to give a, a, a talk on the male osteoporosis uh, on this on first of uh, first of let's say uh, December. Actually, the, in the estimation of the fracture risk in men, in men, people have found out that intervention threshold should be same as those those of women, because the people tend to fracture at the same bone mineral density values. So because of that, the intervention thresholds also should be sharp between men and women. So, what is the take-home message? Now, clinicians should consider the risk of fracture when making the uh, uh, treatment decisions. Just regard this, just considering all the bone mineral density and the T score in a country where the indications for the Texas scanning is not quite regulated, can give a huge problem because you find an innocent, let's say, 50 old men. And then just because they, they underwent a DEXA scan and then found the T score of minus, let's say, 2.5 in the spine, and people start treatment for these people. And also, clinicians should, consider, should remember that the bone mineral density in any age is normally distributed. So if you take cutoff value of minus 2.5, a certain percentage of normal people who are in the bone mineral density as in, in the low range. So, clinicians should consider the risk of fracture rather than just a mere bone mineral density of the T-score in making treatment decisions. It doesn't have one real. The fracture estimate factor risk and the intervention threshold demarcate those who need interventions. The fracture and ID should be used together to identify the risk patients. So, they should not be, they cannot be, should not be used in isolation. An intervention does not mean specific pharmacological measures all the time and may need, may, 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 may indicate that for the assessment of the patient. And the different types of intervention thresholds have been developed and at least four main types. 
and then there are different methods of developing them. And this has led to a, a wide variation of intervention thresholds. And if you look very carefully in countries like China and Japan, and then different studies have given different intervention thresholds for the same country, quite, or quite different actually. So this has led to a little thing. So this is what we're trying to do in Asian countries. What we're trying to do is we're trying to see whether we can get into a, a one common platform and then whether we can use that uh, uh, across all the Asian countries. But we are too far away from that kind of approach. Now there are specific advantages and disadvantages in, in each and every method. And the most appropriate method for that particular country and should be decided locally and based on the uh, things that I said, like economic uh, principles, uh, healthcare capacity, reimbursement policy, and the fracture probability, and uh, occurrence of fractures, and all that. So this is my last slide. Thank you very much for listening to me, and also give me this opportunity to share my experience, and I'm very happy to answer the questions that are Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lekham Basum, for that very informative lecture, where you very clearly told us how what the interventional thresholds are. The questions will be taken at the end of the three presentations. Uh, so please uh, stay connected with us. Sure. So we will move on to the second presentation of the symposium. Uh, of the metabolic bone diseases, hypophosphatasia is rare, but it can be lethal. So we have Dr. Shoshana Stahl Mazer, uh, a consultant endocrinologist at Alfred Health Melbourne, Australia, where she runs an osteoporosis as well as endocrine in pregnancy clinic. Shoshana participates in a broad range of inpatient and outpatient work at Alfred Health, involving all aspects of endocrinology and diabetes. Shoshana leads guideline writing and implementation of the Department of Endocrinology at the Alfred, and she, has all, she is also in charge of the HMO Endocrinology Handbook. She is currently developing a fracture liaison service. Her research began in molecular endocrinology, and now she has clinical focus in bone health, pregnancy endocrinology, and diabetes. She's a, she has a teaching role in the Faculty of Medicine at Monash, where, and she is an FRACP examiner. Shoshana graduated with honours from the University of Monash, Melbourne, Australia, and undertook her basic physician training at Alfred when she, and then advanced in training in endocrinology at Alfred and Monash Medical Centres. So we will listen to uh, Dr. Shoshana Stahl Mazer. Hello, my name is Shoshana Stalmaza and I'm an endocrinologist from the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and there I head up the osteoporosis clinic. So this is a picture of my hospital and this is Dr. Delani who has coordinated this bone symposium and she kindly asked me to speak today so I'm very grateful to her and to all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, Dulani came as a fellow endocrinologist to the hospital here in a, about 2016, five years ago, and it was really lovely working with her on a professional level and getting to know her personally as well. So today I'd like to talk, uh, I've been given the topic of hypophosphatasia and I'd like to start by presenting a case and then talk about the condition itself and then about some work we've done in our osteoporosis clinic in terms of screening for this. And then I'd like to sidestep and talk a bit about osteoporosis and the treatment gap that exists there and balance up the delays that in treating osteoporosis with the delays in diagnosing hypophosphatasia, putting it all into perspective. So to start with the case, which has just recently been published, by Dr. Annabelle Warren, who also presented it at a conference and uh, won a prestigious award for it in Australia. Uh, she was the registrar at the clinic and presented this case to me. 
of a 40-year-old woman from rural Victoria who was referred to our clinic uh, after sustaining bilateral atypical femoral fractures 10 months prior. And just to remind all of you what an atypical femoral fracture is, uh, it's a fracture of the femoral diaphysis between the lesser trochanter and the, supra, tro the supracondylar flare. It's usually atraumatic. It commences from the lateral cortex. It's non-comminuted, so not a whole lot of little pieces, and it's associated with prolonged bisphosphonate use. So back to Miss, Miss MM, she had a past history of osteoporosis with a low trauma fracture of her ankle in 2005 at the age of 25 of the navicular bone, but also on further investigation, it was actually of the third and fifth, third to fifth metatarsal bones. And these did not heal for many years and were complicated by complicated by complex regional pain syndrome. Radiographic osteopenia of this um, was revealed on a CT of her ankle many years later. And that was, and then on DEXA, there was confirmed osteopenia, according to the report, for which she was commenced on alendronate therapy. At that time, uh, she didn't tolerate it for, uh, and so after a short period, she changed over to denosumab. Other past history is consistent with seizure for which she was on sodium valproate and osteoarthritis. There was no significant developmental or pubertal delay, early dental loss or periodontal pathology. And there was no family history of fractures. On, our, uh, on investigation, this is the bilateral atypical femoral fractures that occurred when she fell from standing height at at the age of 39, as I said, the re soon before her presentation to our clinic. She was at a party trying to catch a friend who was actually falling, and then she fell herself and sustained these fractures. You can see this is the symptomatic right one. And on the left, it's just this area here, which is an incomplete uh, asymptomatic fracture. This is the healing of the fracture. And it's been treated with an intramedullary nail, but the other side has just been treated conservatively, which I must admit I'm a bit concerned about. The DEXA that was done now, oh well, in 2019, not in 2013, revealed the following, which is essentially a normal Z score in the lumbar spine. And what is really considered a normal Z score in somebody who is under 50, because we only consider it to be significant if it's less than two uh, in those under 50. We don't use the T score in the young people that you can appreciate why they probably called it osteopenia if they just looked at the T-score and it would have been less than that in 2013. So her denosumab was seized at the time of the atypical femoral fracture and unfortunately she was unable to work, having to mobilise around with crutches uh, and using a four-wheelie frame for longer distances. On examination, her height was 153.1 centimetres with a weight of 69.2 kilos, giving her a body mass index of 29.5 kilos per metre squared. And there was no obvious craniofacial abnormality. Here are her investigations, which were essentially unremarkable with normal renal function and electrolytes, vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. But we can see here that the CTX, a marker of bone resorption, was reduced, but it was in the afternoon. Uh, and it can be falsely low at that time, in particular when it's non-fasting. But the biggest thing is this value here, which is the ALP that's far below the upper limb, the lower limit of the normal range. And uh, we looked back and found some that were as low as seven. So she progressed to further investigations with a vitamin B6 level and off any sort of supplements, it was too high to be recorded. Cranio Cranial x-ray showed no evidence of craniosynostosis uh, and repeat femoral 
x-rays uh, showed that the atypical femoral fracture on the right was not healing and there was near completion of the left one with, ex with the exception of an intact medial cortex concerningly. Hip and knee x-rays showed mild degenerative arthrosis of the left hip. She progressed on to ALPL gene testing for hypophosphatasia, which revealed two pathogenic heterozygous variants, confirming a case of recessive hypophosphatasia. So she has adult hypophosphatasia, which was diagnosed following bilateral atypical femoral fractures after anti-resolvative therapy upon presentation to a tertiary centre osteoporosis clinic. We commenced her on teriparatide, which was hospital funded. And we have just renewed this to give her a full two year course. And in fact, we're even stretching it to every day, every second day. Uh, she's had no fractures despite a recent fall on that. And, and can, um, happily, we saw some improvement with healing of her, of the incomplete atypical femoral fracture and also some union here on this one. She was mobilising without crutches around the house, which was excellent for her, but still unable to work with ongoing generalised aches, however. Uh, and femoral x-ray this year, however, on the recent, most recent review, showed that there was no change from what you see here, but no regression, and she remains on the teriparatide. So, So hypophosphatasia is one of the genetic risk factors for atypical femoral fractures amongst others. And hypophosphatasia, it's, we'll talk about that now for a while, it's a rare genetic disorder affecting the mineralization of bone. The cause of it is a defect in the ALPL gene, which is a gene that codes for a protein called tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase phosphatase and that's an enzyme that sits on the cells and in a moment I'll show you some of the pathophysiology of it but without its function osteomalacia occurs. There are different different manifestations of it with severe forms being more rare occurring in the child in childhood but less severe forms that detect that are detected in adulthood can occur with some frequency up to one in 500. And here, here is a bit of a description of the spectrum that you can see about hypophosphatasia with perinatal forms being lethal um, and the manifestations occurring in childhood of premature loss of the deciduous teeth uh, with craniosynostosis. And here you can see deform deformation um, of where the bones are supposed to be. Um, and in the adult, you find osteomalacia with fragility fractures that are poor that, that do not heal properly with malunion uh, you also can see some pyrophosphate arthropathy and actually some seizures as well uh, and the location of the fractures are often atypical femoral fractures so femoral diaphyseal fractures as well as uh, foot fractures so now looking at the physiology, we'll start with just normal bone physiology. This is the mineralization of bone. We've got the osteoblast that then um, produces the, the products that are necessary for mineralization of the bone with collagen fibers, and then the crystal hydroxyapatite. And that's what mineralizes the bone. And the way that it does that is by an, the enzyme that I spoke about called tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, which dephosphorylates inorganic pyrophosphate and liberates um, the phosphate, which is what's important in the hydroxyapatite to then enable uh, mineralization. The substrate itself, inorganic pyrophosphate, is actually an inhibitor of bone mineralization. So when tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase is not working or ALP is not working, what we end up with is we don't have the phosphate to, call, to, to create hydroxyapatite and therefore there's unmineralized bone. And in addition, we have an excess of the substrate um, 
which is going to inhibit the bone mineralization further. So that's why we get what's called soft bones with this condition. And in the, in the brain, there's the reason why these people have seizures is because the normal, because in normal functioning, tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase, it dephosphorylates vitamin B6 or PLP into a form that can cross the blood brain barrier where it's then rephosphorylated and is incorporated into GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So that in the situation where it's not working and we have no TNA, well, non-functional tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase, you have an increase of the substrate here of B6 and uh, in, and it does not get through because it can't be dephosphorylated and then rephosphorylated. And therefore GABA is lower. It can't be incorporated into GABA. And therefore without the inhibition of GABA, the seizure threshold, th threshold is lower. The atypical femoral fractures that I just mentioned before are a hallmark of both osteoporosis with prolonged bisphosphonate therapy, um, but in particular a hallmark of adult onset hypophosphatasia. They're associated with, uh, and, in, and in hypophosphatasia, bisphosphonates actually compound the problem more so than they would in somebody without hypophosphatasia because bisphosphonates actually mimic this this inorganic pyrophosphate, which itself is that potent inhibitor of mineralization. So there is a bisphosphonate potent inhibitor in addition to the excess um, pyrophosphate, inorganic pyrophosphate. And there have been over 11 case reports of such occurrences. It seems that denosumab can also have a similar effect. And, and an inhibition of um, the rank ligand, which impairs osteoclast recruitment and therefore reabsorption of, uh, resorption of damaged bone also would contribute to this because the bone's not healthy. Uh, and there've only been two cases prior to ours of this occurring in the context of denosumab. And we attributed ours to denosumab given that she was only on alendronate for four months. So the diagnosis is made with low alkaline phosphatase and an elevated B6 in the context of a clinical suspicion. And then the diagnosis is clinched with genetic testing for a mutation in the ALPL gene. The treatment is with the actual enzyme, which is very exciting. And you can see it's called acetase alpha and it works very well. Uh, as you can see here, from the unmineralized bone to 24 weeks later, mineralized bone. However, it is prohibitively expensive and only used in children. It has shown fracture healing in adults, but it's just not possible to continue its use due to cost. So the other options are teriparatide, which we used on our patient, and it's shown to have variable effect on bone density and may improve healing, but the, the response is not generally sustained. Usually it's after, after a year, it's no longer sustained. And you can see so far, that's how our patient's behaving too. And then there's the antiscleroson therapy, which may have a role. So trusimab has actually been studied in this space as um, however, romosozumab has not. However, can, uh, we have a bit of a concern about this because it doesn't seem as though it's going to actually treat the problem because although it, it causes new bone to be developed, they, there's the underlying defect of the mineralization remains. So in conclusion of the case in hypophosphatasia, before I move on, uh, it's rare, but it's increasingly recognized, it's rare, but it's an increasingly recognized cause of fragility fractures in adults. And the low alkaline phosphatase that's often available on standard pathology provides a, an important clue for it. B6 and the ALPLG testing may then follow. Importantly, anti-resorptive therapy is contraindicated here and directed enzyme therapy is available, but currently cost prohibitive, and therefore teriparatide can be considered with some e efficacy, at least in the short term. And just thought it was cute to say that ALP can stand for always look at the pathology, which is what my registrar 
uh, titled her talk in that um, that I referred to before. So it's become more common, um, at, at least more recognised, hypophosphatasia with uh, Maria Luisa Brandi from Italy uh, creating this um, group. And uh, this is in Italy, which is a consumer group. And then there's also one in America called Soft Bones. So interest is higher in the community now. And uh, there's a lot of lobbying for more funds uh, for the treatment to become more available to more people and for more research. So that's good. And the day that this talk is going to be shown to you all is actually on the 30th of October, World Hypophosphatasia Day. So I think that's very timely. So. And the research interest has also increased with uh, the PubMed articles increasing over time, as you can see. And in my hospital, we've also joined into this, not only with the case that I presented, but we also set out to see if there were any missed cases of hypophosphatasia in our, in our adult osteoporosis clinic. And we presented this at the um, American Society for Bone Mineral, um, for Bone um, in America last year. It was a virtual conference. And what we did, these two registrars, Liz and Claudia, went through all the records of the patients who were seen at the clinic from its inception in 2012 up until 2020 and uh, looked at the ALP values and recorded any of those that were less than 30 by and interrogated the clinical notes around those. And this is what we found. It's a complicated flowchart, but I'll take you through it. Out of the 100 and 1,866 patients reviewed, only 27 didn't have any available pathology. And in 168, at least one ALP level was less than 30, which we called our lower limit of normal. Some call it 40, but we called it 30. That's what our pathology uses. And in those, the others, 1671, were over 30, 30 or more. So in those, we found that there were, there were two groups sorry, three groups. One group where the, the value was low just transiently in only one calendar month. Uh, and then there was the group where it was low for more than two calendar months, but for less than half the time that they had available results and all results are at least four months of results. And then there was the other group of which there were seven patients where the patient's ALP was low for the majority of time for more than 50% of the months evaluated. Uh, and all the months available were evaluated. We found that we had already diagnosed this condition in two people at the clinic, one in a patient in this group, and one is the patient MM who I've already discussed. Looking at the others, these were further evaluated in detail. And out of those, two of those had no further clinical suspicion for HPP and therefore their case wasn't worked up further. One of them, did have a clinical suspicion. However, um, the, the diagnosis would not, would not impact um, sorry, in that one, the clinical suspicion is low. However, a diagnosis of HPP would have treatment implications because we are planning to, we would like to commence anti-resorptive therapy and therefore we are going to investigate further with, um, with a B6 value and we're trying to contact, they're being contacted now. Then out of three patients who have already been checked with a B6, their clinical, because they had a high clinical suspicion, one of them is, is failing to attend our appointments, unfortunately, due to advancing dementia, and we're really trying hard to find her next of kin but haven't been successful as of yet. And another one we have already diagnosed with the genetic testing as a result of this audit. Unfortunately, this patient did not receive any anti-resorptive therapy beforehand. And the final one um, is in the process of being worked up. 
Interestingly, we were wondering, you know, why we have 9% of our patients that had low ALPs, which is quite high when you compare that to the literature. And we wondered why this was the case. And we found that a lot of them were in the context of heart or lung transplant, and we are a transplant centre. So we have a lot of these patients, as well as um, other causes that you can see here, like sepsis and plasma exchange immunosuppression. We further evaluated this condition um, by testing the by by surveying the members of our endocrine society to find out if they were familiar with uh, if, if they used ALP as a tool to evaluate for hypophosphatasia in their um, in in their clinical practice, and we found that most of them really that um, would look up would look up the ALP if it was available in their workup and that 70% consider HPP when they think about osteoporosis. So that was good, but it could be better, it could be 100%. And importantly, this occurred soon after the presentation that was done on the case in, in question. So maybe it was in the forefront of the, the, the conference um, of the society's members' minds. We also looked at the patients who presented to our service, not just the clinic, but our service with AFFs, because that's part of a international study, and looked at the 22 patients over this over the last five years that have presented with AFFs. And two of those had at least one low ALP, one of whom is the patient with advancing dementia who I mentioned who was captured in the other study. And the other one um, is does not have any other clinical suspicion, so no further workup was done. Now, just for the end, I'd like to step out of what is rare and into what is common, and that is osteoporosis. I'm not going to go into the details because we're running out of time, but it's a condition we all know about as a silent disease. And the concerning thing is that 80% of patients are still, uh, after they fracture, they are still not diagnosed or treated for osteoporosis. And that is a big concern. Especially, so, so to show you here, we've got one third of women and one fifth of men over the age of 50 that suffer an osteoporosis fracture. And this absolute value is going to increase significantly because the population is aging. So the fracture increase, the fractures will increase dramatically on an absolute level. And here, that what that also means is that the dependency ratio for older adults is increasing. I draw your attention to this over here, where it shows the number of dependents per 100 people of working age. And the thick burgundy line is the whole world over time and how it's increasing here. And then I draw your attention to the Asian group, which of which Sri Lanka's part, uh, and the grey one. And you can see that the grey one starts lower than the rest of the world, as in than the world average. But then in about eight years, uh, it's going to cross and exceed the average of the world according to these predictions. That's where you're from. And there's this, there's nothing about Sri Lanka here, but I did my research and I found that the speaker before me, um, Professor Lekamwasam, has uh, done a lot of research in this area. And I'm not sure whether he's presented it yet or not because this is a pre-recorded um, talk, but uh, he has, he has um, published 45% of women uh, that have osteoporosis in Sri Lanka over 50, well, postmenopausal women, and 6% of men over 50. And this was many years ago, 2007 for the women and 2009 for the men. So these numbers are only expected to increase. And he has written this as a concern to consider the big burden that osteoporosis will place on the world and in particular on, on you. So that needs to be thought of and kept in mind. Uh, and fractures can be prevented by evidence-based treatment. But unfortunately, there is a big evidence treatment gap. And so many people, all these values of people that have had fractures have not had medication to prevent their, their, their future fractures, even though the medication could prevent it by half. So it's very, con it's, a, it's a concern. And we found in my hospital, when we did an audit about five years ago, that we had 
an evidence treatment gap as well in the order of about 20% of people only being treated, which is about the same as what the rest of the world shows, so we're no better, unfortunately. And in response, we created this flow chart which, suggest, which, which suggests to commence anti-resorptive therapy on everybody over the age of 50 with a minimal impact fracture provided who are treatment naive provided that they meet specific criteria and we're in the process of getting this through as a, a pharmacy driven fracture capture service and i just want to talk about one small part which is that in the past um i'll be quick this because i realize i'm nearly running out of time but in the past osteonecrosis of the jaw was a big concern for everybody and it was so much of a concern that people often delayed necessary osteoporosis treatment in order to get their teeth under control before their osteoporosis treatment either started or continued and this led to a surge of fractures and this is a case in question that i won't talk about in detail but a person who was 90 years old and with severe osteoporosis and multiple fractures due for a dose of zoledronic acid, which was delayed because she was uh, having dental work done that was delayed as well. People don't always get to the dentist when they say they will. And as a consequence, she fell on the day that her zoledronic acid was planned after finally being dentally cleared. So putting this into perspective, you might've seen this already. Um, and it shows that there's a very big fracture burden, which is reduced with bisphosphonate therapy. And putting it on this scale here, you can see that osteonecrosis of the jaw hardly even reaches visibility. So putting that into perspective, all the dental societies, the American one, the Australian one, they've all consistently said now in the last year or so that the morbidity and mortality of osteoporosis going untreated is far far outweighs the small risk of medi medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw such that osteoporosis takes priority and so i say that because in our um, pathway we have we have said that unless the tooth there are teeth that are black or mobile we proceed with treatment and the same thing here although we have added ALP to ensure that it's more than 30. However, we don't, we really don't want ALP, the ALP management um, and consideration to delay treatment of the bigger picture, which is osteoporosis. And so we need to put it into perspective. It's something that needs to be considered, but not to, not to the detriment of the bigger group. Uh, and so here we can differentiate these conditions. I'll say this very quickly. Usually the fractures occur in different sites, vertebral for osteoporosis, femoral shaft for, um, and, and, and feet, feet for HPP. Also the laboratory findings, as I explained before. And also the bone density. It's usually likely to be normal or only minimally reduced in HPP compared to osteoporosis. So the take home points, uh, from this talk are that osteoporosis, so we need to balance the delays. Osteoporosis is common and needs the world's attention to reduce the evidence treatment gap. HPP must be remembered so that the diagnosis isn't delayed and that contraindicated medication like um, anti-resorptive therapy is not administered. However, consideration of HPP shouldn't delay necessary fracture preventing treatment for osteoporosis. And when an ALP is low, remember that this could be for another common reason. If there's a clinical suspicion, then the ALP should be repeated. A B6, if it's still low, a B6 should be ordered. And if all of that's consistent, don't give any anti-resorptive therapy while this is being worked up in the most speedy process as possible. And, and then consider genetic testing. Uh, like with everything in medicine, in summary, clinical acumen is paramount. And that's it for me. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Dr. Stahl Mazur, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation on a very rare disease. Uh, please, be, uh, please be connected for the Q&A session, which starts after Dr. Kotachi's presentation.
so uh, bone health we know is not a gift it's an accomplishment so our next presentation is on current management strategies of osteoporosis uh, we have on stage dr dulani kottachi who is a consultant endocrinologist and senior lecturer in the department of physiology faculty of medicine university of kalania she obtained a mbbs with a second upper class for, uh, in uh, 2005 she obtained a md medicine in 2013 and mrcp uk in 2017 her main research interests are endocrine complications in thalassemia gestational diabetes and complications of diabetes she has more than 35 publications including peer reviewed index journals and conference papers she has authored a book chapter in diabetes mellitus she underwent uh, A and Z BMS clinical densitometry course in Australia 2000, in 2015. She has received the presidential award in 2018, and the SLMA HT Fernando Award for height measurement technique in osteoporosis patients in 2017. She was a member of several committees in formulating national guidelines, including uh, field guidelines for gestational diabetes mellitus. She was the secretary of the Physiology Society of Sri Lanka in 2018, and the assistant treasurer of the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists from 2018 to 2020. So over to you, Dr. Kotachi. Thank you, Madam, for the kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My task here today uh, is to talk to you about current management strategies of osteoporosis. as i think the two previous speakers uh, were talking about the osteoporosis and um, how i think in sri lanka especially we have underdiagnosed patients and as well as untreated patients compared to the western countries probably due to the lack of facilities and lack of treatment uh, opportunities to our patients but i think this is the time as uh, soshana said that in the next 20 uh, to 30 years we are going to see a big rise in patients with osteoporosis and uh, the fracture risk the burden is going to be very high for a developing country like ours so get on with it the background is that uh, just to define what osteoporosis is for the uh, purpose of uh, starting this lecture it's a progressive uh, skeletal systemic disease and it is characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissues and it has a high risk of bone fragility and uh, patients with osteoporosis are susceptible to fractures as you all know So bone formation and resorption as you know uh, is by uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts having a balance between uh, these uh, two uh, types of cells but in osteoporosis what happens is due to a defective bone mineralization uh, there is excess of osteoclastic function because of that the loss of bone matrix and Uh, which can increase the fracture incidence especially in the spine hips and forearms which are the common sites of fractures uh, these fractures are most commonly seen in postmenopausal age basically due to loss of estrogen as well so you can see in this picture what a normal bone looks like and what an osteoporotic uh, bone looks like in this you can see uh, the defect in bone uh, mineralization as uh, soshana said it's a public health burden uh, with 50% of women and 25% of men about the age of 50 uh, will have a low trauma uh, fracture during their lifetime so you can imagine the burden uh, of disease when the aging population rises uh, in the next uh, few years so it's a dramatic effect on individual and society because hip fractures when you have a hip fracture the mortality of a person uh, dying within a year is about 25% and in more than 50% of hip fractures patients never return to their normal life so they'll be uh, uh, either bed bound or like difficult to walk or disabled so with a uh, burden on the family and the society as well okay let's talk about now we know what the burden is 
So how should we screen these patients for osteoporosis? Uh, it's by doing a dual energy X-ray uh, absorptiometry, that is DEXA scan. So DEXA scan in our country is only available in main tertiary hospitals uh, and uh, in the private sector also it's very expensive. So that is the lack of facility where the problem really arises in diagnosing our patients with osteoporosis. So who should have a bone density? Should all patients have a bone density? No. Uh, the recommendations from the National Osteoporosis Foundation is women aged 65 years or older and men above the age of 70 should have a bone density done. If you have a person, it's postmenopausal women and men aged 50 to 69 with, uh, so this is premenopausal women and men aged 50 to 69 with clinical risk factors. And adults who have had a fracture after the age of 50 years. And adults with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or taking medications like uh, steroids, um, which are associated with low bone mass or bone loss, should have a DEXA scan done to screen for osteoporosis. So this is a screening test uh, we do uh, to diagnose osteoporosis. So what are the risk factors associated with osteoporosis? The major risk factors are the history of fracture as an adult. As uh, Soshana said, 80% of patients who had had a fracture uh, was never treated or, were, or never diagnosed. So they're treated for the fracture and sent home but never thought of giving uh, an anti resorptive therapy or screening them for osteoporosis. If they have a family history of first degree relative having a fragility fracture, if they are Asians, Caucasians with postmenopausal women are at risk of uh, osteoporosis, if you have a low bo body weight, if you are a smoker, and if a person is using oral corticosteroids uh, for more than three months, they are the major risk factors for having osteoporosis. Additionally, impaired vision, estrogen deficiency uh, prior to age of 45, like pre, uh, um, premature menopause, dementia patients, uh, poor health, frail patients, recent falls, if they have low calcium intake throughout their lifetime, low physical activity, and if they are um, using alcohol more than two drinks per day. So there are additional minor risk factors for having osteoporosis. There are medical conditions associated with uh, increased risk of osteoporosis like COPD, Cushing's, if you have eating disorder, hyperparathyroidism, hyperphosphatasia as the case uh, Shoshana described, irritable bowel syndromes, rheumatoid arthritis, if you are a diabetic, if you have multiple sclerosis, multiple myeloma, stroke, uh, if you're having thyrotoxicosis, vitamin D deficiency, and liver disease. So you can see multiple gamut of disorders where we only think of that particular disease, but we never think of the bone uh, health of a patient. So I think this is an opportunity for us to understand and rethink whether we should screen our patients for osteoporosis. There are medications, especially I will not go through the whole list, but anticonvulsants, steroids, uh, if you are treating our patients with very high doses of thyroxine, uh, aromatase inhibitors used for breast cancer, and special lipoprovera we use in our country for um, uh, reproductive purposes as a, um, uh, therapy, uh, and so they can cause um, osteoporosis as well. This is what a DEXA scan report looks like. Um, so you can see uh, this is from the spine, and we see the bone mineral density. The T scores are here, and the Z scores are here. So this is what a DEXA scan report looks like. And the criteria, as Professor Lekham Vassam said, depends um, on the BMD. So category um, of normal is a BMD of the T-score. We look at the T-score of minus 1 and above. Uh, osteopenia is minus 1 to minus 2.5, and osteoporosis is minus 2.5 and below. So what is a T-score? It compares an individual's bone mineral density with the mean value of a young adult and expresses the difference as a standard deviation. So from a normal person's uh, bone density, what it looks like uh, at that particular age for that particular person. So that is the uh, meaning of a T-score. So the WHO uh, have given the diagnosed criteria depending on the BMD, but not from the FRAX. So this normal is, as I said, um, T-score of minus one to above. So if you have uh, minus 2.5 uh, SD of bone density and a fracture, you are called as a severe osteoporotic patient. 
And as Sosh said, most of these osteopenic uh, uh, fractures uh, happen in the osteopenic range. We look at osteoporosis and we treat osteoporosis sometimes when you see the reports. But as uh, Professor Lekha Vassam said, we neglect the osteopenic patients and who will really deserve treatment for osteoporosis and uh, just looking at the BMD is not good enough. So osteopenic patients will have more fractures than uh, osteoporotic patients uh, uh, in this study, as you can see. So the fundamental problem is stratification not sufficient. That is, that is why we go for the FRAC scoring and uh, I will not go through this uh, in detail as uh, Professor Lekham uh, I think gave a detailed description of how to assess the risk uh, of a patient using FRACs. So it gives us a 10-year fracture risk model and it estimates the likelihood of a person to break a bone uh, due to a low bone mass over the period of 10 years. So if you use this, uh, you can know uh, the risk of you having a risk uh, of fracture if you know your BMD values. Okay. So when you diagnose a patient with osteoporosis, we're not going to jump and treat all the patients. We're going to look for a secondary cause, uh, especially if the ISET score is less than two. So the ISET score gives us a clue whether this patient is really having a secondary uh, cause. Uh, for this osteoporosis other than the postmenopausal estrogen loss. So standard testing we do for patients are the calcium phosphate, uh, the creatinine, alkaline phosphatase, vitamin uh, D levels, and the PTH, uh, if possible. So it's also difficult to get in our, uh, most of our centers. So based on the clinical history, we should have a good clinical history. We should consider doing the thyroid testing, um, serum protein electrophoresis, testosterone, 24 urine calciums, um, ionized calciums, uh, celiac panel, and 24 urine free cortisol as well to look for Cushings, if you suspect Cushings. And uh, the bone turnover markers are also very useful to have a kind of a baseline so we know where our treatments are headed. So who should be treated? So now we've got a patient who've had a DEXA and we've screened for risk factors um, and look for the, um, the secondary causes for this osteoporosis and to treat. We should initiate therapy for patients um, with a BMD score less than 2.5 at hip or spine uh, if they have had a prior vertebral or a hip fracture. If they've had low bone mass, T-score less than 2 to minus 2.5 at hip or spine, you put to a FRAC score and you put get the probability risk of 10 year probability risk of hip fracture of most more than 3 and if there's major osteoporotic fracture, more than 20. So this is, these are the indications for you to start treatment uh, for osteoporosis. So it's the same thing in a small um, ch chart. So women more than 65 and 70 should have a DEXA scan ideally. And when they are screened, if they have low T scores um, at lumbar spine, hip, and femoral neck, yes, uh, then we is a candidate for treatment. If they are in between of osteopenic range, you put them into a FRAX model, and if they have risk of having more than 3% for hip fracture, more than 20% for major osteoporotic fracture in that FRAX scoring, yes, treatment is indicated. But there will be exceptional cases, as Professor Lekham was, um, spoke, where we need to individualize our patients uh, whom we decide on treatment. So what are the medications available to treat our patients with uh, uh, osteoporosis? So we have estrogens, calcitonin, raloxifene, ibantronate, aledronate, uh, resedronate, solidronate, denzumab, and teriparatide. Out of these treatments, in our country, we have the ibantronate, we have the aledronate, and the resedronate, and the solidronate. We don't have denzumab. Uh, teriparatide is available, but only um, used for uh, special circumstances like we'll talk the indications for that. We have the estrogen, uh, but we don't have the calcitonin or the roloxifene. So evidence of fracture reduction, so especially the bisphosphonase. You can see alendronate, resedronate, solidronic, and then uh, solidronic. The bis bisphosphonates will work for the vertebral fractures, the non-vertebral fractures, and the hip fractures well, and so as the denosumab for all types of fractures. And teriparatide we have mainly uh, on the vertebral fracture and non-vertebral fracture reductions.
So um, ibendronate, roloxifene, and quercetonin are mainly for the vertebral fracture risk reductions. So how do you choose an agent? So we have so many options to choose from. So how do you choose an, uh, a treatment option for osteoporosis? It depends on the efficacy, the routes preferred by the patient, the frequency of administration, the side effects, and the non-skeletal effects. So efficacy is a broad spectrum. Let's say we've talked about whether it's a affect all vertebral, femoral, and non-vertebral fractures. And specific, if you're looking for especially for the vertebral fracture reductions, then we can choose as it is. So route of administration could be oral, uh, could be given IV, but it should be preferred by the patient. Frequency, we have daily preparations, weekly, monthly, quarterly, twice yearly, once yearly. So we have the frequency where we talk with the patient and decide. And side effects depend on the agent and the patient, especially the GI side effects of bisphosphonate. And the non skeletal effects, the breast cancer reduction of fluoroxifene is, um, is important for the patient to know. Let's talk about bisphosphonates, the commonest uh, anti resorptive agent used. So it can prevent uh, and treat osteoporosis uh, in postmenopausal women, men with osteoporosis, uh, patients with glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, and treatment of Paget's disease in men and women both. So how does it work? It inhibits the bone resorption by attaching to bone surfaces, undergoing active resorption, and inhibiting the action of osteoclasts. And it leads to increase in bone density, and it can reduce the fracture risk as well. So these are the types of uh, bisphosphonates available. You can see the, out of these, uh, the bisphosphonates, uh, the commonly used one are the alendronate and the zolidronic acid. Um, the vertebral fracture risk reduction is about 56% uh, in zolidronic acid and 44% for alendronate. And hip fracture, 42 for solidronic and 40% for hip fracture reductions. And non vertebral is about 18%. So, out of these bisphosphonates, the most efficacious one will be the solidronic acid, which is given IV and uh, as an yearly infusion, and then uh, followed by the alendronate. But you can see the abandonate given as a monthly uh, tablet has mainly effects on the vertebral fracture reductions and there's not much data available for hip fracture and the non-vertebral fracture uh, reductions. The adverse effects of bisphosphonates are the hypercalcemias, the hyperphosphatemias, and they complain of muscle pain, cramps, especially if you've given them IV, uh, the solitonic acid, they will complain of flu-like illness for about two, uh, 72 hours, you know, sometimes seven days, uh, especially with the first dose of uh, the solitonic acid. The GI side effects are very common with the oral bisphosphonates, uh, abdominal pain, reflux, um, as Shoshana said, the osteonecrosis of the jaw is a very rare complication, but still um, people talk a lot about it and delay treatment. Um, uh, so the recommendations are not to delay treatment unless you have a very um, severe dental work to be done in a patient. Um, atypical femoral fractures are also very rare uh, due to prolonged uh, treatment of bisphosphonates. Visual disturbances are rare. So oral administration of bisphosphonates is the common, most commonly available preparation in Sri Lanka. So it must be taken at least one hour prior to first food um, and with plain water and uh, should be taken upon waking up and should be swallowed with a full glass of water and patients should remain upright walking, standing or sitting without lying down for at least 60 minutes. That is to prevent the esophagitis. The solidronic acid is given as a single 5 milligram infusion over 15 minutes, once a year for three years, and should be given cautiously for patients with uh, renal failure. It can be safely given for patients with EGFR more than 35, and this is ideal for patients, especially with GI contraindications, uh, with the oral prefer the formulations, or the poor compliance, because it should be taken weekly, the alendronate, where this is given once a year. The cost-wise, it'll be the same. It won't have much difference giving oral once a week or IV once a year. 
So how long should we give bisphosphonate? This is, this is not forever. You can't be, I've seen patients being uh, on bisphosphonate for so many years without being really tracked uh, by the patient or the doctor. So alendronate, oral alendronate should be given for five years. And the ivisol tonic years is given uh, for basically three years, IV yearly three years. This is for the basic general, uh, the category with mild to moderate fracture risk. But if you have a patient with high risk of fractures, this could be continued even further. So bisphosphonate are distinct from the other osteoporotic therapies because their positive effect will last for several years after discontinuation and they will have a drug holiday to prevent stress fractures uh, of the femur will be uh, done. So bisphosphonate can be stopped for up to five years but they should be assessed uh, at two to four year intervals to see whether they are uh, but they need reinitiating of the uh, osteoporosis therapy. So, delizumab is a human monoclonal IG2 antibody administered via subcard injection given uh, every six months. And this will um, affect the bone remodeling and reflected in bone turnover markers. And this should reverse after six months. So, you just can't, uh, when you stop at uh, delizumab, um, the effect will reverse. So you have to continue with another anti-resorptive agent and you should recommend recommended for up to 10 years. Then you have to um, assess the patient's risk whether they need continuation of therapy. This is how it works on the rank ligand in, as a rank ligand inhibitor and so it will protect a form, it will inhibit the osteoclast formation. So. Adverse effects of denizumab are the hypercalcemia, inflammatory disorders. They can also have osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femoral fractures, but they are very rare. The advantage is you can give this patients with renal failure as well. The teriparatide is a PTH analog, and we have PTH-related protein analogs as well. So this is given in especially for patients who have had osteoporotic fractures, multiple risk factors for fracture, extremely low BMD, and they have failed to tolerate or still on bisphonate still having fractures. Then this is kind of the bone antibody treatment, and it's given for primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis as well. So when you give the PTH, it stimulates osteoblast function and increases GI absorption of calcium and enhances the bone turnover by initiating bone formation. So it has greater efficacy for reduction of vertebral fractures and non-vertebral fractures, but uh, not uh, much available data on the hip fractures. So after stopping, the effect will be off after one year. So you have to, co you have to uh, continue with another anti-resorptive therapy. Adverse effects are the hypercalcemia, osteosarcomas are very rare, in, it was noted in rats, but uh, very few case reports up to now in uh, humans. They can have dizziness, head cramps. So duration of treatment is maximum two years for teriparatide. It's given as a subcut injection given daily. Serms or the raloxifen uh, prevent osteoporosis in postmenopausal uh, post women only, and the mechanism is a tissue selectivity, uh, acts as an estrogen ag uh, agonist. And it shows reduction of vertebral fractures, but not much for the hip and the non vertebral fractures. It's important uh, to say that menopausal hormone treatment is much superior than the raloxifenes. Then comes estrogen therapy, especially for postmenopausal women, but it should be considered the last of the treatment options, uh, and you should do the smallest dose possible for the shortest amount of duration. Um, so when to consider treatment of HRT uh, as a treatment option for osteoporosis, especially patients under 60 years or less than 10 years of postmenopause or at low risk of DVT, and those um, who are not considered for bisphosphonates or denizumab due to many reasons, if they have bothersome vasomotor symptoms. So these are the treatment options for patients with uh, osteoporosis, and you can choose. So in commonly in our country, we use the bisphosphonates, either oral or IV, and then uh, we assess their risk after uh, two to three years of treatment, and then decide how to continue the treatment. Uh, then if they're still having fractures, we, as we don't have denosumab, we go for teriparatide. 
What about calcium intake? So calcium plus vitamin D supplementations reduce the risk of hip fractures, but not the vertebral or the non-hip fractures. So the total intake of calcium should be ideally 1,200 milligrams per day and should be by both dietary and supplemental calcium. And supplemental calcium should be less than 1,000 milligrams per day to avoid the renal stones. So we should advise the patients uh, how to get their calcium from our diet. So eight ounces of glass of milk uh, contains 300 milligrams of calcium. Eight ounces plain yogurt, 450 milligrams of, uh, of calcium. And you can see uh, same for orange juice. So there are people can take these uh, amounts and uh, get 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day. What about vitamin D? So adequate serum vitamin D level should be uh, ideally 50 nanomoles uh, per day uh, is recommended from the European guidelines and the Endocrine Society of USA recommends more than 75 nanomoles per day. So usually it's met by giving ingesting 1,000 international units of vitamin D per day. But they have found that high dose intermittent dosing like 20,000 per week or 500,000 per year, the high dose intermittent dosing can actually increase fall risk. So by giving vitamin D, the purpose is to increase the muscle strength of patients, to prevent falls, it's very important. So these are the modes of getting vitamin D, especially natural sunlight. It's important to prevent falls in these patients as well, because we have to prevent, ask the patient um, not, to, not to fall, so it's very important. So circumstances surrounding the fall, if they are on drugs, acute chronic medical problems, uh, if they have problems with vision, uh, if they have problems with neurological functions, uh, assessment of cardiovascular risk assessment is very important to avoid falls for a patient to prevent them from having a fracture. And lastly about exercise and people with osteoporosis, they are afraid to exercise. They are afraid of falls, but exercise will actually improve their bone strength and especially the balance training and impact weight bearing exercises and high intensity strength training are very important. But swimming is not a preferred mode. So monitoring of patients with osteoporosis is by doing a DEXA scan one to three years. Uh, one approach is to consider the BMD change, not the T-score change, the BMD change, at least significant change approach of uh, 4% from the previous uh, scans. And also you can use the bone turnover markers uh, as an alternative therapy way of identifying the response to treatment. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kotachi, for that very interesting lecture. Uh, please be tuned in for the Q&A session. Uh, so uh, starting with the questions, we have one from the audience. It's to uh, Professor Lekha Basam. Uh, it says, Professor Lekha Basam, sir, does fragility fracture and low trauma fracture mean the same? Does fragility fracture and low trauma fracture mean the same? We are not hearing you, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Thanks. Loud and clear. Okay, okay. Um, low, low trauma fracture does the uh, fragility fracture uh, means somebody sustaining a fracture of falling less than a standing height, uh, standing height or less. So uh, generally, in, in clinical practice, they generally mean the same thing, yes. Okay, sir. Sir, does the FRAC score include the BMD always? And if not, uh, there, can, there can be overdiagnosis of uh, the risk of fractures if the BMD is not included. Is that correct? Well, that's a good question, actually. Um, we have done at least about two, you know, in our two publications, we have mentioned that the Sri Lankan crux model, the outcome, is does not vary that much whether you have, have BMD input or not. Um, in, the, in this case, we are not alone because many countries have shown that putting BMD into the equation can make only a very slight difference. Uh, reason for that is because the most of the variables which are included, like let's say age, gender, a use of corticosteroids, and they all are very big determinants of, major determinants of bone mineral density. So when you include clinical risk factors, 
and they in part actually compensate for the lack of BMD. So even without BMD, the flex model outcome is not a huge problem. So uh, many countries have shown that you know flex work with or without BMD in almost in a similar manner and very slight difference on only between the two. Next question, sir. In a resource poor setting, beyond a certain age, let's say beyond 75 years, can any female be started on bisphosphonates or is that wrong? Say that again, say that again, sorry. I, I, I don't hear very well. Sorry? In a resource poor setting where we are not able to yeah. do a DEXA or a DXA, uh, can, a, can a female beyond a certain age, let's say 74 years, can that person be anyway started on bisphosphonates? I think option would be for you to run a fax. Let's say if you are working in a, in a, in a resource poor setting and then uh, you don't have access to the exam. And uh, this is a similar situation you get in, in UK as well. In UK certain areas, the, the BMD access is quite restricted. In those areas, what clinicians can do is run the fax model, uh, run the fax calculation and without bone mineral density, and then decide on the treatment. So um, rather than setting an age limit, you should take other factors also into, into consideration, like the gender, the BMI, and other clinical risk factors in making the decision. So I would not set an age, because we find there are enough people, you know, who are, let's say, 70 years, 80 years, having normal bone mineral density and normal uh, fracture risk, not having high fracture risk. So I would rather combine clinical risk factors and then, then decide with the free turn on. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Any other questions from the audience to Professor Dekam Basam? Yes, thank you very much, sir. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Mazur. Dr. Mazur, uh, in, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, is there an ethnic variation in hypophosphatasia? Is, is there something like that? Is that an ethnic variation? Yeah, I um, thank you. Thanks, I understand the question. I, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Uh, so the other question is like, uh, now we see, we know that hypophosphatase can cause a lot of bone deformities, but it, can it just present as bone pain and sort of what triggers us to test for hypophosphatase? Yeah, so I think that's a very, that's a, a a, a good question. Um, yes, the answer, the simple answer is yes, it can present just as bone pain and it, there is um, evidence that these, uh, when they've described these populations, that they, uh, that one of the things they have is poor quality of life with bone pain, muscle pain, that sort of thing. Um, and the best screening test is the alkaline phosphatase. I'm not sure what your biochemistry panel is in Sri Lanka. I didn't actually look that up, but I in, most of the literature says that it's readily available uh, and in Australia it is as well if you've done uh, general biochemistry. So, oh, can you tell me, is that the case in Sri Lanka? Do you have... Dudani, that's right. No, we test phylcholine phosphatase in the uh, anywhere routinely, right? No, in your LFTs, in your liver function tests. Uh, we actually now, personally, I would just do a SGPT and a SGPT when monitoring my patients uh, because the liver profile right. is actually expensive to get the whole thing. Right. So, so then in that case, if it's not just readily available, then you would start with your clinical features and the, um, the things that you would look, look at would be if they've had any fractures that are poorly healing, if they've had any problems with their teeth, so any periodontal problems or deciduous teeth that, that fell out, you know, the milk teeth that fell out earlier um, than, than their peers or than expected. The, um, the other thing to think about are the location of the fractures if they do have fractures. So mainly the, hip, ma mainly the femoral shaft and also the feet and ankles. And then if you do have a clinical suspicion after that, then I would I would advocate ordering the alkaline phosphatase. And it, just to clarify, it doesn't have to be the bone-specific one. Um, it's just the non-specific alkaline phosphatase. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that an I said thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mazur. Uh, the next question is... Thank you is so much for having me.
Okay, thanks. <laughs> so there's one more question, Dr. Kotachi. High forces in, a f in female patients, is it an indication to start adendronate? Uh, yes, I think we see widow's hump, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Um, it is due to actually osteoporotic uh, fractures of the uh, thoracic spine. But in patients, if you really are unable to get a DEXA, yes, I think that would be an indication. As, But as Professor Lekhamasam said, it's just not one factor. We look into um, a starting treatment with osteoporosis. But yes, uh, it is due to osteoporotic hump that we get the widow's hump. Thank you so much. We and, have um, more can, I, can I say something? What about Delaney, talk about your project that you did at our clinic because that's yes, relevant. Yes, to yes, yes. We uh, with Shoshana we uh, conducted a, a research uh, when I was in Australia from uh, the osteoporosis clinic, and um, it was to measure height. Uh, so that was very important. We got an award also for the mm -hmm. uh, HD Fernando uh, uh, award from the SLMA also. Um, measuring heights. This is, so subsequently, we measure heights of patients um, instead of look, looking at the X-rays, but whether they have got a height loss. That was very important, I think, uh, for especially the clinic uh, like us, where resource poor settings uh, look for vertebral fractures. Yes, it was a great project, Sosh. And um, may I thank you for accepting our invitation uh, and giving us a wonderful lecture uh, from Melbourne, and also to Professor Lake Kamasam for, uh, for accepting our invitation and um, doing the lecture for us. Thank you, both of you. Can I squeeze in one more question quickly, Dr. Kochachi? Now, you said in patients with long-term steroids, we can do, a, we should do a DEXA to see uh, like whether they need, um, need bisphosphonates. Is there a dose of steroids or a time period where they should yes, have been on? Uh, yes, madam. So, uh, so this is kind of a complex topic where we look at the age mm -hmm. as well as the, uh, the amount of steroids they are on, especially if they are on more than 7.5 of oral prednisolone per day for more than three months. And we have to assess their risk as well from the FRAC score. And if they are having mild to moderate risk, depending on the age, if they're less than 40, we would not give them uh, um, bisphosphonates. Right. Okay. But if they're at high risk, uh, mm -hmm. then we would give the bisphosphonates. But that is for less than 40 years. So if they're even more than 40 years, we would risk still give the uh, bisphosphonate depending on the risk. If they're okay. moderate to high, yes, we would give not the low risk. So for low risk patients, calcium and vitamin D are sufficient. Okay. But we need to assess them with a DEXA scan. Thank you very much. So I thank all speakers for making this symposium a very colorful one. Uh, so there is, a, there is a certificate in recognition of the outstanding contribution as resource persons. Uh, I would uh, like to present that to Dr. Dulani Kottachi. Then uh, Professor Lekham Basams and Dr. Mazur's uh, certificates will be posted. Thank you so much for joining us.